This is Herb Kressel, and welcome to the June Radiology Podcast. Uh, this month we have uh, three uh, really interesting uh, discussions for you. First, uh, my colleague uh, Dave Kalmas, who is the deputy editor for Neuroradiology, will be speaking with uh, Dr. Mayank Goyal, uh, who with his co-authors uh, wrote a, uh, a very important paper on the analysis of workflow and time to treatment and its impact on the outcome of endovascular treatment of acute ischemic stroke results from the SWIFT Prime randomized control trial. Uh, the trial and this paper uh, pre-print publication have uh, received a lot of interest and I think our viewers and listeners will benefit greatly from this discussion. Next, uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Ali Germazi, the deputy editor for musculoskeletal uh, imaging, will be speaking with uh, Dr. Johannes Rodel, uh, who with colleagues from uh, Thomas Jefferson University uh, Hospital uh, reported on the potential utility of a combined approach deploying ultrasound and MR arthrography in imaging medial elbow pain in baseball players. Uh, and I think uh, whether or not you're a baseball player, uh, this is an important topic and you will find uh, the discussion of interest. And finally, I'll be speaking with uh, Drs. Uh, Kathleen Brandt and Celine Vachon of the uh, Mayo uh, Clinic and Mayo School of Medicine on their study uh, comparing clinical and automated breast density measurements and their implication for risk prediction and supplemental screening. Uh, Drs. Brandt and uh, Vashon uh, reported extensively comparing different commercial uh, software packages for this to conventional uh, BIRADS uh, uh, interpretation. I think uh, this will be of interest, particularly in the area uh, that we are in of Brent's breast density notification uh, in many states in the United States. As always, I hope you enjoy uh, this month's podcast. Hello and welcome to this video podcast. My name is David Kalmus. I am the deputy editor for Neuroradiology. I'm joined today by, by Mayan Goyal, who is an interventional neuroradiologist and professor of radiology at the University of Calgary and was the PI of the ESCAPE endovascular revascularization trial. We are here today to discuss his paper entitled Analysis of Workflow and Time to Treatment and its Impact on Outcome in Endovascular Treatment of Acute Ischemic Stroke Outcomes, Results from the SWIFT Prime Randomized Control Trial. Welcome, Dr. Goyal. Th thanks, David. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, good to chat with you. Yeah, so we should just start with... Uh, you're telling us what, what you did briefly and, and what were your major findings? So as, as probably your audience knows, the, the world of stroke has recently changed. There have been five recent NEGM published papers showing the superiority of endovascular treatment over what was previously the standard of care. And as a consequence, the standard of care now has changed. And uh, I was significantly involved in two of the trials, ESCAPE and SWIFT Prime. And subsequently, we had, during, while we were running SWIFT Prime, we did a very detailed workflow analysis and collected all kinds of times related to, to how the workflow was happening and where the delays work. So this paper is essentially an analysis of workflow, where are the delays, where we can improve, and the impact of time on outcome. And what did you and find? It, and in terms of summarizing the main two results, one is something that is intuitively obvious and which we all know, the time is brain. The slower we are, the less likelihood is the patient having a good outcome. And this is extremely, extremely import, important. It is a powerful effect. The second important finding that was there in this paper is 
the adverse impact of not going to the correct hospital the first time around. So the way that it played out in this study, approximately two thirds of the patients went directly to the comprehensive stroke center, and one third of the patients went first to the primary stroke center, got their IV TPA started, and then were transferred over to a comprehensive stroke center. And the median delay by not directly going to the comprehensive stroke center was around two hours, which mm -hmm. is massive for the population that we are talking about in terms of influencing outcome. So can you put into perspective for us, say on a per 30 minute basis or so, what does that do to expected outcome? Yeah, so, so this is, uh, I'll, tell you it, uh, I'll tell you the answer to this question in two different ways. One is, uh, as you know, in any study, uh, we are limited by calculating this information based on the patients that were included in the study. And in the study, the study that we have done, for every 30-minute uh, delay, initially the effect is massive, but just to give a sort of a ballpark figure to the audience, is a 10% reduction for every 30-minute um, um, delay. Now, it's not linearly oriented. The delay is much more influenced upfront. But the other part, which is important to remember, is what I call as the denominator fallacy, and I've written about it extensively, um, which is the idea of that all these patients were selected on the basis of imaging. And as we get later and later, the likelihood of finding favorable imaging will go uh, will get significantly reduced. And that is sort of based on experience and based on an intuitive sense and based on the biology. So if you think about it, if you're one minute after the onset of stroke, 100% of the patients will have favorable imaging. And if you're at 24 hours, nearly all the infarcts would have evolved and sort of happened. So obviously there is a curve between one and 24 hours. We don't know exactly the shape of the curve. But the other part, which is important to realize is that the later you are, the less is the likelihood of having favorable imaging. So which is a part which is not quantified in this, in this paper, but is, is very important for, the, for everyone to understand. So to paraphrase, for every 30 minutes delayed, there is a 10% decrease in the proportion of patients who achieve a good outcome. Is that, that what you're saying? That, and that also that the sample is biased to say that people who were delayed were excluded because of imaging exclusion. So really this is a best case scenario and maybe the real world is worse. Exactly, exactly. So, so the way I teach my sort of residents and fellows is if you're 30 minutes from onset and you, let's say you have 100 patients with M1 occlusion, likely 98 per patients will be having good imaging. If you're at four hours, probably 50 of them will be good at having good imaging. If you're at seven hours, probably 10 of them will be having good imaging. So in those 10 at seven hours, maybe six of them will have a good outcome. But if you look at it at a population level, it's six out of 100, which will have a good outcome based on this. So, so it has a double impact. One is you get better as you go faster, but any, the other part is you're going to be treating more patients and giving more patients an opportunity to have better outcomes. Sure. Um, so speaking of imaging, <laughs> um, I know there's uh, tremendous debate and the, the science is in flux about how much imaging do we need if time is brain and I've got a patient with a dense MCA and a good story, can I go straight to angio? And when should I do even a CTA um, uh, or uh, a CTP? So, okay, so I'll tell, answer this question in a few different ways. So first quick thing is in this study, we analyzed the data in terms of was the CTP used for decision-making or not used for decision-making. And the way that the results played out, CTP did not have any impact. The patients that were treated without using CTP information, the effect size and the overall impact was just as much as, as um, in the patients who did have CTP. The other part is on average, look, waiting for the CTP and doing the analysis, took an average of 18, 19 minutes extra, which is not a small amount of time. So there, there was a difference in workflow. And I have corroborative information in terms of that overall Swift Prime workflow was on average slower than escape workflow by around 20 minutes or so. And in terms of protocol, one big difference between the two was that in escape, CT perfusion was not required. Um, so that's sort of one part of it. The second part of it is whether a CTA should be done or not. And we've done this analysis in IMS3 where we looked at patients with CTA and without CTA. And this is apples and oranges. So it's not a precise analysis. This was published in circulation. So there's two things that we found was that CTA can be consistently done in most centers within five minutes. The second part was because CTA allows you to evaluate the arts, the carotid bifurcation, this, that, and the other, there is a possibility that it may actually speed up the rest of the procedure. That is what we found when we analyzed the data for IMS3. 
Now, to answer your question precisely, if you have a 45-year-old where you're expecting reasonably straight vessels with a dense MCSI with an NH of 20, one hour from onset, sure, go ahead, save on the CTA, go, go to the next stage sort of thing. But if you're an 82-year-old and things like that, I think that CTA may still be useful in terms of planning uh, the rest of the, the procedure. And CTP. CTP. Why do you do a CTP? Yeah, so we, we don't do it. We don't recommend uh, doing it. There's some talk about whether in the later time windows, um, CTP could potentially be of use. Um, um, that, is, that is yet to be seen in escape. There were a total of 53 patients that were beyond six hours. The effect size on those 53 patients was the same as the rest of the trial, although it did not reach this statistical significance. Um, I do want to point out, though, that if you don't do CTP, one of the problems that is there, which people face in the community, is the ability to interpret the non-contrast CT scan and the aspect scoring, um, which, which, as you know, came out of Calgary. So we do have sort of um, various solutions for it. One is to optimize the quality of the CT scan to see gray white differentiation. And the second is to look at collaterals because collaterals goes hand in hand with, with the aspects. So the way that we practice locally is you look at the non-contrast CT, you look at the collaterals on multiphase CTA, you go back and look at the non-contrast CT and use the collaterals to further uh, enhance your interpretation of the non-contrast CT. And we overall find you can do this in two to three minutes and works very well. So are you using the multi-phase CTA as a perfusion scan or you're simply using it as an adjunct to your aspect scoring? Yeah, so we're using it, like we're not using it as a perfusion scan for sure. We're using it as a collateral scan and the collaterals we're using because um, good collaterals means good aspects and bad collaterals means bad aspects 99% of the time. And there are two exceptions to that. One exception is if the patient is 30 minutes from onset and has really, really bad collaterals, but the aspects changes haven't set in. The second exception is that let's say the patient was hypotensive on the scene, the collaterals collapsed, the brain died. By the time the patient comes for, comes for imaging, the blood pressure is back to normal and you can see the collaterals again. So those are the only two disconnects between the two, but we have an experience of over 1,000 patients now where basically the two go hand in hand. And the other part which I like to talk about is that ultimately you have only two decisions or one decision to make, go endovascular or not go endovascular. So the way that we practice is you look at the CT head, you look at the collaterals on multiphase CTA, if the two go hand in hand, just go. And you sort of, you, you make up your mind is the aspects 8-ish, 9-ish, 10-ish, good collaterals, and the patient is sort of otherwise worth fighting for, go open the vessel. Okay, so uh, you mentioned a two-hour delay for, for going to a primary stroke center as opposed to comprehensive um, what about delays within the radiology department for our audience? Um, what should they take from this paper in terms of how to modify workflow to diminish any delays? So, so I like to use this word, which I call parallel processing, in terms of that from the time that the patient is about to hit the emerge. So one thing that we set up many, many years ago in our hospital is pre-notification, where we are already notified before the patient arrives to the hospital. And if you think about it, at the level of emerge, once the patient hits the hospital, there are four or five things that need to be done. One is obviously the ABCs, the vitals. The second is setting up a good IV line. The third is someone has to take history. Fourth is someone has to organize imaging and, and those kind of things. So rather than one person doing it one after the other, the, second, the idea is to do it sequentially. The other part is for the radiology department to treat it as a super emergency, give it the same status as what you would in cardiology for an acute coronary syndrome, or for that matter, what an acute uh, severe trauma would get. And essentially, the radiology department has to be sort of primed for it that this is a super priority. The third thing that we put into action is we always have sort of speak, a fake ID ready for a stroke patient who comes in similar to a trauma, this thing, so that we are not spending time typing the patient's ID in the system. There's always, so to speak, an unknown ID ready to go. And somewhere along the way, the patient's actual ID catches up with it. So we sort of just have an unknown ID ready for a stroke or trauma patient and just fire the orders. And it says acute stroke. And there's an acute stroke protocol, which is built in, which is an optimized CT head and a multi-phase CT. So bang, 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 you get the patient to the CT. The CT is already set up. The contrast is loaded. It takes a total of three minutes of imaging, non-contrast CT, multi-phase CTA. And if it is during daytime hours, we all converge at the CT scanner, take a decision in the CT scanner, and go straight from there to angio. Now, obviously, if it's after hours, there's a slight difference in workflow. But even at that point in time, we try to sort of set up things in such a way that we minimize the time in radiology and try as much as possible to take the patient from CT to angio as opposed to from CT going back to eMERGE and then coming from eMERGE to angio again. 
Sure. So do you have any data from your center to, to, to try to quantify how much difference that approach makes over the standard approach? Um, like in the sense that we, we, we don't have data in terms of sort of a, approach A versus approach B, but we do have data over the last 10 years as to how we have speeded up things. And essentially, I wrote this paper in 2011, I think, or 2012 in JNIS, where at that point in time, our uh, CT scan to reperfusion, not groin puncture, CT scan to reperfusion, at that point in time, I think in 40% of the patients, we could open it within 60 minutes. And we further improved from there. And in escape trial, um, which was sort of primarily across Canada and, and US and some centers in Europe and, and Asia as well, uh, the median time from start of imaging to reperfusion was 84 minutes. So, um, so essentially, that is, that, that is to show that across multiple centers, it's doable. Now, that is not to say that it will be doable in every case, and that is not to say that we should sort of sit on our laurels and not continue to try to improve. So what about the issue of um, administering IV TPA? Um, should that be done? Should that be hanging as soon as the non-contrast head CT is performed? Um, should it get in the way of, of any other aspect of the patient's care? Right. So basically, the, the current guidelines are IV TPA should be given as early as possible based on IV TPA criteria. So the way that we function during daytime hours is if we are converging at the CT scan, the CT head gets done. If it's eligible for IV TPA, the neurologist sort of says, okay, let's start mixing the TPA. And whenever the TPA is ready to be given, the, they go ahead and give it. Whether the patient is on the CT scan table doesn't matter. Practically speaking, what happens is by the time they're mixing up the TPA, the CT angio gets done. And right as the patient is coming off the table on CT angio, they go and give the bolus. Now, obviously, after hours, if the patient is coming in at 2 a.m., as you can imagine, there's slight differences and slight delays that get produced at the current moment if it's after hours. And uh, but, but at the same time, I would say now, now in our workflow, probably 50% of the time, we get the vessel open before the TPA drip is run out. Hmm. Okay. So while we have you on, on the video, uh, can you tell our audience uh, what's coming down the pike in terms of stroke intervention research, either in, in progress now or completed? So a um, couple of different things. One is, um, as of now, um, based on the current guidelines from the American Heart American Stroke Association, um, the treatment is approved from onset to groin puncture under six hours. Um, um, in escape, we enrolled from zero to 12 hours, but currently it's approved from zero to six hours. And there are a couple of studies that are running from the beyond six hour window. Um, and it's likely that they will get finished in the next couple of years. So we'll see further data in that regard from a late window perspective. But I do want to stress the fact that even if the late window trials are positive, we cannot get past the denominator denominator fallacy, that uh, we may be able to show that endovascular treatment is great for certain selected late window patients, but that does not mean that we should not continue to make efforts to get, a, get the correct patient to the correct hospital as fast as possible. So that's a study that is ongoing, which we should see the results of. Um, the second part that people are starting to talk about is that in a typical sort of M1 occlusion, do we really need to give TPA or not? And is there a case for doing a trial in which we randomize to TPA versus no TPA. And there's a few trials that are being talked about, one in Netherlands, one in US, um, and we'll see how that all plays out in terms of sort of uh, whether we can save the money and the complications and the, and the infrastructure required for giving TPA. Um, those trials should probably start soon. To my mind, what is the most exciting thing um, in my personal opinion is that for the first time in human history, we have a temporary MCA occlusion model in which a patient comes with an MCA occlusion and we are able to consistently open it. And to my mind, this is the time to go back to the world of neuroprotection. That is there something that we can do that holds the core together, doesn't allow it to expand, the neurons stay alive while you go and open the vessel. And that is what um, uh, we in Calgary are planning to devote the next uh, four or five years of our life. That will be the ESCAPE-2 trial or the ESCAPE-NA1 trial. We're working with this compound NA1. We've been working with it for many years. Uh, we did a previous study. Michael Hill was the PI, which was called INACT. It was in aneurysm coiling patients. And that was sort of proof of principle study and a safety study, which showed that the drug is dramatically safe. And now we are embarking on this study, which will be sort of a phase three study to test neuroprotection along with uh, revascularization. So that is another exciting opportunity that is open to us collectively in terms of being able to help a greater uh, number of patients. All right, well, uh, Mayank, anything we didn't talk about that you wanna touch on before we finish? 
Another interesting thing that we're doing is that there were five trials that were published recently. And in fact, there are two other trials. One is called Thrace, which is from France, which hopefully should be published soon. And another one, which is from UK, which is called Beast. So uh, the way that it all played out was that we were able to set up a collaboration across all the five trials, which is called the Hermes collaboration, in which we have a patient level uh, database that we are putting together of all the five trials and hopefully all the seven trials. And um, I'm, I've been, I'm, I'm sort of chairing that committee together, the Hermes committee. The first paper from the Hermes got published a couple of weeks ago in Lancet. The second paper from Hermes which will be a time is brain analysis. That's what we're doing right now. But from the point of view of radiology, the very interesting thing that we're doing is we put together an imaging database of these 1,286 patients right now. And maybe we'll add on the Thrace and Peace patients, which will add, make it to a 1,700, 1,800 patient database, imaging database. And we're going to sit and reinterpret all that imaging and we'll have a much better feel for issues like what is it that is a predictor of bad outcome what is a predictor of that dp is not going to work just that will be the the best data database on that subject uh, on this subject ever so you know watch out for some exciting publications as they start to come out of the hermes database all right well Mayank, thanks for joining us and congratulations on your paper and please send us more great papers in the future thanks thanks dave good to chat with you Good afternoon. Um, today, a podcast about musculoskeletal uh, radiology, and the paper that we uh, choose for this month uh, is uh, titled uh, Potential Utility of Combined Approach with Ultrasound and MR Arthrography to Image Medial Elbow Pain in Baseball Player. And I have the honor and privilege to have with me on the other actually side of Philadelphia, Johan Schrödel from uh, Thomas Jefferson University uh, Hospital in Philadelphia. Uh, thank you for uh, being with us, Johannes. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, actually, my first question, and I do think it will be the question of anybody, what prompts you to do this study? So we, um, in, at Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia, we have a pretty high population of um, baseball players, and baseball pitchers um, especially. We do the imaging for the professional sports team, the um, Phillies. And many years ago, my colleague and a pioneer in, in musculoskeletal ultrasound, Dr. Nazarian, um, went to a spring training um, to Clearwater in Florida with the Phillies, and he started MSK ultrasound there, and he really on an initially experimental basis um, tried the ultrasound in a few players. Um, and that's how it all started. That was about 15 years ago. And slowly, you know, he published um, some um, important papers initially and slowly be incorporated his findings in clinical practice. So this study includes patients from 2003 to 2013. That was the so 2003, so we seriously, um, in general, had um, baseball players imaged in that way, meaning MR arthrography and um, stress ultrasound. But the initial um, idea of stress ultrasound and, and the idea for the study really came from Dr. Nassarian um, with baseball players from the Phillies in, in, in Philadelphia. I do think still even actually the span is multiple years, but uh, it's impressive because the number of players that you included is, is huge. Um, let's actually be uh, brief, and I want to ask you the second question. What are the main findings of your study in brief? The main findings are really that um, the usual so-called gold standard MR arthrography that is used for imaging of um, medial elbow pain in baseball players is um, a highly accurate study, but it can further significantly improved by adding um, ultrasound to the imaging of medial elbow pain, and um, specifically stress ultrasound um, and conventional ultrasound. So adding um, those three tests, meaning stress ultrasound, the conventional ultrasound, and um, MR arthrography together um, had substantially higher accuracy in diagnosing patients with um, medial elbow pain than each modality by itself. Okay, uh, in essence, uh, what, uh, why do you, you think this is an important finding? In, 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 another way, in another actually word, if you want, how your findings would impact uh, or would change care in these baseball players? Um, it is extremely important since um, the surgery for an onocular ligament injury, for example, the UCL tear, the Tommy John surgery, um, is first of all technically complicated, and the recovery time um, is long, it takes at least a year, 12 months. And 
the return to previous level is, of play is not guaranteed. So many players, they come back to play, but they never perform um, as they did before. So it is important to avoid unnecessary surgery. And one has to be certain that there is a UCL tear um, before a radiologist or the orthopedic surgeon um, send the patient to surgery. And it is important, any, any study that would increase the, the accuracy to diagnose um, UCL tears is really um, important, especially for, for baseball players. Um, I have a question there, Johannes. Um, in your opinion, and I know this is not actually part really of actually what you, uh, you know, uh, gonna, going to publish in this paper from May in radiology. In your opinion, what is the relationship between the player age, the number of pitches thrown, uh, or activity level, if you want, and the relative uh, utility of the ultrasound and MRI or MR hydrography? That is a great question. Um, our study really shows that MR and ultrasound together are very strong for diagnosing UCL tears. However, when it comes to findings that are more age-related, including posteromedial impingement at the elbow, which is cartilage loss at the posteromedial aspect of the elbow, and um, common flexor tendon and muscle injuries, ultrasound doesn't add much. I mean, you can imagine that cartilage defects can be seen in ultrasound. That's where really MR orthography is strong. And in older patients, experienced pictures, the, these findings, you know, muscle tears, strains, and cartilage issues become more important. So the older the picture gets, the less value um, does um, ultrasound add. So in general, ultrasound is really strong in younger middle-aged patients where UCL tears are um, the most common injury. In older patients, of course, it's still important if the UCL is the primary culprit. But if cartilage issues come, come into play or even on the nerve problems, then um, MR is really strong and um, ultrasound adds a little less. Thank you. Um, I'm actually, um, looking at the images in, the, in, in your uh, uh, manuscript and paper, um, I found really the images of the MRA and also the ultrasound impressive. And I would like you particularly to com comment on figure number four, four mm -hmm. especially why stress would change the um, appearance on ultrasound of the uh, UCL tear. Yeah, so on that figure four, you can see on, on figure four B, the upper image, that's the, the rest ultrasound image. And that white line um, outlines the ulnar trochlear joint, that's the medial aspect of the elbow joint. <laughs> that's under rest. And then uh, image C, 4C really is under stress. So you can see how the ulnar trochlear joint gap widens um, to in this case um, about 7.7 .7 millimeters previously um, 2 millimeters so there's substantial widening of the ulnar trochlear joint with stress and the reason is that the ligament that spans the joint the ulnar collateral ligament is torn and therefore is lax and the um, joint shows increased gapping so that's the whole um, idea of um, stress ultrasound you really try to show joint gapping and thereby indirectly diagnose a ligament tear that is uh, quite impressive um, when, when I look actually at uh, the paper uh, as a whole, as I said before, um, there is the kind uh, actually of MR arthrography, which is compared to the ultrasound. And someone will maybe ask uh, the question, the following question, and especially in Europe or actually in Asia, uh, they will say, do you think MR alone without arthrography is sufficient uh, for uh, such a diagnosis or you really need actually the MR arthrography? You know, in your experience, what you find actually uh, that MR arthrography will give you more than a simple MRI of the elbow. Right, that's a good question um, as well. The, we, we are big believers in MR arthrography, not only for the elbow, but also other joints, including the hip or the shoulder, if indicated. And the reason for um, elbow MR arthrography is that the cartilage is better imaged in general. And the cartilage defects for postromedial impingement that are best, better seen, as well as intraarticular bodies often nicely seen after um, contrast is put in the joint. And for the UCL tear, you can see it on figure um, 4A as well, how the contrast really undermines the tear and, and, and triggers into that proximal UCL tear. And that would be difficult to see um, without contrast. So we, we think really contrast adds substantial value, especially in professional or collegiate players. So I, I looked also at actually at the... Uh, um you know, uh, the diagnostic value of ultrasound, and I saw that the sensitivity is around 81%, 91% specificity and accuracy of 88% when you use ultrasound alone. So uh, for me, the question would be, do you think a portable on-field uh, ultrasound would be helpful in making quick diagnosis uh, and hence uh, medical decision in injured baseball players? 
Uh, we know in Europe they do it on, on soccer, soccer players. So is this something that you can you foresee uh, for a baseball player with an ultrasound on field? Yes, I can absolutely um, see that in the future. The, our study really shows that the accuracy is, is high, and um, I think it's an ideal tool um, that is portable. Um, as I mentioned, Dr. Nassarian goes to spring training and, and examines the, the players there, and it would be very, very suitable for, for on-pitch um, on the field diagnosis, whether it's um, baseball or any other sport, I think um, ultrasound will, will go into the stadiums. Um, so my next question, if you are actually really happy with the ultrasound and you think it's really, you know, accurate, sensitive, specific, etc. I mean, to the level that is really acceptable here and more than acceptable. Now, my question would be simple. Why do we need MRI? Yeah, very, very good question as well. Um, when it comes to medial elbow pain, there are many other diagnoses that have to be ruled out or considered, including, you know, posterior medial impingement, which again you can barely see on ultrasound. You can't see cartilage defects. Um, intraarticular bodies, um, the muscle injuries, tendon injuries. These are only really seen in MRI, as well as stress bone marrow edema, which is a common injury in pitchers. Where you know, at the distal humerus or the olecranon, we see a lot of stress bone marrow edema in pitchers, and that can cause medial elbow pain. So you need really the information from the big picture information from the MRI. In addition, I think that even for the UCL, I feel much more comfortable. And we, we do a lot of ultrasound in Jefferson, but um, we always um, have the MRI at the same time. It's really more like um, um, a complementary exam. And the ultrasound is extremely useful, but we use it as an add-on um, for MRI. The other reason why ultrasound, I think, is still in a way controversial is that the it is operator dependent, so you need some experience. Um, it's not easy to learn ultrasound um, from books. You, you have to actually practice and, and, and perform ultrasounds before you, you, know, you can make a, a comfortable diagnosis. So I think in the bottom line is really that it's a combination that is key in the future because ultrasound, stress ultrasound, combines the anatomy from ultrasound with the um, dynamic exam from a physical exam. So in a way, stress ultrasound is really a fusion modality between physical examination and, and ultrasound. I think that's the beauty of um, stress ultrasound. Yeah, there is always actually that learning curve, as you know, uh, for ultrasound, which is absolutely, you, you uh, delineate that uh, very well. And I do think uh, uh, that's uh, absolutely, uh, you know, the case here for uh, the baseball players. So my last question here, um, since radiology is an international uh, journal, as you know, uh, and uh, distributed worldwide, um, baseball is only popular in the United States in Cuba and Japan. So we left with a lot of actually part of the world that uh, would not be maybe interested, uh, I would say, uh, perceived by, by actually baseball. But there are other sports, throwing sports, as you know, uh, for example, handball, that can cover actually the rest of the world, uh, excluding the US, but now actually European are very interested there. Uh, what do you think actually uh, this paper would be, or these findings would be actually also uh, translate to actually someone who is throwing, but in handball player's uh, elbow? Yes, it's, it's the, same, the same pathology. Any, any sport that is um, overhead throwing and that puts a lot of stress on the elbow really is affected from um, UCL tear. So in, in Europe, it's handball, um, it's tennis, um, where we see UCL tear. So it, it is really any sport that has um, overhead throwing or, or racket sports um, that have a lot of stress involved um, really can benefit from, from the study and from stress ultrasound. Thanks, Johannes, uh, very much. This was actually a pleasure, and um, um, I hope that uh, you get more information for us next time. So we'll uh, we'll hope for uh, the next paper about the baseball players, somewhere else maybe. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks uh, for all the team for the hard work, and uh, um, you know, thanks for being actually a reader and uh, you know a, a a author for radiology. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Dr. Gomez. Thank you. This is Herb Kressel, and welcome to the June Radiology Podcast. Uh, today, I'm joined by Dr. Kathleen Brandt, who's Associate Professor of Radiology at the Mayo Clinic School of Medicine, and Dr. Celine Vachon, Professor of Epidemiology uh, at the Mayo School of Medicine as well. And uh, these two uh, uh, were co-authors of a, a very provocative study entitled Comparison of Clinical and Automated Breast Density Measurements 
Implication for Risk Prediction and Supplemental Screening. Welcome, Dr. Brandt. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Vashan. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Now, uh, let's get started. Historically, the determination of breast density uh, on mammography uh, to help guide uh, screening uh, has been made with uh, BIRADS. Uh, was BIRADS effective in this role? What were some of the problems with BIRADS? Dr. Brandt? Well, you're right. Uh, traditionally, mammographic breast density has been assessed visually by radiologists at the time of the mammogram interpretation, and it's assessed into four categories of increasing density based on the BIRADS lexicon. And the top two categories are what we consider dense breasts. And mammographic breast density has become a very important issue. Uh, We know that it's an independent risk factor for cancer, with the women with the highest breast density having three to five-fold increased risk compared to those with the lowest density. And we know that it's inversely related to the sensitivity, sensitivity of mammography due to masking effect. So for these reasons, currently, as of this week, 26 states have now passed breast density laws that specify that women must be notified in writing of their breast density, and ideally they would have supplemental screening tests considered per discussion with their primary health care providers. So today, breast density is a very important issue for women undergoing mammography. So, so why do we actually need the automated breast density measurements if we've been using BIRADS? Dr. Brandt? Well, BIRADS density categories have been shown to be associated with breast cancer risk, but they're also very subjective. So there's been many studies that have looked at the inter-observer variability in the radiologist assessment of the BIRADS density, and it's only moderate. So the idea behind the automated methods is that now, because we have full-field digital mammography in most institutions, we can now apply these automated programs that will automatically assess breast density and reduce the variability. Dr. Vashan, uh, anything you want to add about this? I, I just want to mention kind of from the research perspective, we're also interested in assessing changes in mammographic density due to treatment effects such as tamoxifen. And in order to do that, the BIRADS may not be the most appropriate measure in a four-category assessment. So having an automated measure that's systematically objective and reproducible across centers would be ideal for assessing these types of changes that can inform women's future efficacy of treatment. Sure. So uh, uh, I gather apparently there are now two commercially available products that will do these automated breast density measurements, or at least two that you uh, assessed in your study. Uh, But I was surprised to read that there were some differences in the way they actually go about determining the metric uh, of breast density. Uh, Dr. Brown, what are some of the differences between the two approaches? Well, the two systems that we evaluated, Quantra and Valpara, uh, do have different ways of calculating breast density. Now, some of this information is proprietary, and we aren't aware of how they do it. For example, how they calculate breast thickness uh, is a proprietary um, situation that they don't They didn't let us know how they do it. Uh, But we do know that like Quantra will sum the maximum density measurement for each for each breast and then give an average, while Valpara will uh, do uh, the breast altogether. So they do have different ways of assessing. And then presumably since they're uh, commercial products, they may alter some of their proprietary software as they get different releases. Is that right, Dr. Vishan? Yes, that's true. And in fact, the version we use of Quantra, for instance, at the time of this paper has now been updated. So we're using the additional, we're actually looking at the updated version now. But these are, you know, there's also some subtle differences like including the skin line, not including the skin line. And all, but more importantly, I think for this paper and these results is how they assess the BIRADS-like categories. We call them BIRADS-like because they're not identical to what the BIRADS um, from the clinical radiology perspective, but they have different cut points for how they do that also. I see. So going back to your study now, Dr. Brandt, what was the specific rationale for the study that you reported on? So we compared these two automated methods for assessing density with, and we used their BIRADS-like categories in addition to the dense volume, um, and we compared it to the BIRADS categories determined by the radiologist. 
and we looked at factors such as risk association with breast cancer and also the number of women that are put into the dense category versus the non-dense category with each method. Okay, and Dr. Vashon, could you go into some depth of sort of that, what did you actually do in your study? What was the method and how did you sure. tackle these questions? Sure, we were, we were fortunate to be collaborate, sorry, collaborating with a, another um, individual, Carla Kurlikowski at UCSF, who's done a lot of studies in breast density, and together we all have a grant to evaluate these automated measures. And so what we did was we recruited, or um, through a retrospective study, we obtained about 2,000 cases that were new cases, that is, newly diagnosed, and then matched them to a set of about 400. 4,200 controls. And, and they were diagnosed with invasive breast cancer, is that they correct? They actually, about 70% were invasive cancer. That's okay. a, thanks for asking. So about 4,200 were controls, so unaffected. And importantly, in this study, what we really wanted to do was get a pre-diagnostic mammogram. So we could really look at that prediction or association of breast cancer before the person was actually diagnosed. So what sure. we did then was assess, we used the clinically available IRADS categorizations from practice. So we did not have one or two radiologists assess all these sure. images, but we did run them all through the Volpara and Quantra software systematically, as Dr. Brandt mentioned, to assess uh, volumetric percent density, dense volume, and then uh, the categories of IRADS by these measures. And, and what did you find? So we found actually regarding the risk association, that is how these measures were associated with risk, were very similar. And in fact, if you look at figure three from our uh, results, what you can see are all these measures and their association with future breast cancer. So importantly, um, our take home was that they are, as far as their association with risk, it is very similar across the BIRADS category, the clinical BIRADS category, which is in the top set of four rows, in which you see essentially a 2.3-fold increased risk in the highest or densest category relative to the second or somewhat average uh, risk category. And those differences are similar in Volpara BIRADS categories, the second set of rows, in which you see for the highest extremely dense about a 1.8-fold increased risk relative to kind of the average or BIRADS 2 category. And similarly for Quantra, you see about a 1.9. So they were similar, but interestingly, even with all the noise inherent across all the radiologists, we still saw a little bit stronger discrimination of breast cancer risk among the clinical BIRADS density categories. That is, this measure could better partition who was going to be a case and who was going to be a control. Um, so that was one of our main findings. The other finding was actually how you classify dense breasts. So Dr. Brand alluded to the fact that BIRADS 3 and 4 is basically a woman who is a dense breast. And so um, what we found was that although there was some similarity, you know, the majority of women um, that were dense hovered around 50%, there was about 14% difference, actually, between the BIRADS clinical density category and the Volpara and Quantra categories. That is, if we were going to say a woman is dense, breast, that measure could change if a woman went to a radiologist that was using Volpara versus a clinical BIRADS measure versus Quantra. So that variability actually um, is very relevant. Um, but, but at the same time, you might expect this from multiple measures and even within measure. So uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, Dr. Vashon, the, uh, there was more consistency within machines rather than uh, across machines, is that correct? We actually didn't assess within or across machines, um, but we can be assured, and, and we did assess concordance of a set of mammograms, which we, we ran on software at multiple sites. Right. And, and no matter where you run the software, if it's the same version, you're going to get the same result. And as we know, if we take a clinical mammogram and give it to five radiologists, that's not going to be the case. Right. Okay. Now, uh, Dr. Brandt, th you didn't specifically look at the variability in BIRADS, the clinical BIRADS determinations in this group of patients, you use the existing uh, uh, clinical BIRADS category, uh, but you did state earlier that uh, it's basically there's moderate agreement. Uh, that's what you said in the beginning. So uh, taken overall, how would you compare this to the level of agreement 
uh, in the automated methods you've evaluated? Yeah, so I think one of the main points of our study is that if you use the same automated method, you're going to get the same density measurement. It's reproducible. But if you use a different automated method, you will not necessarily get the same density measurement. So between automated methods, it's similar to the variability you see with a radiologist's visual assessment of the virus density. But within the same system, the variability should be minimal to zero. I see. Now, thinking about sort of the future state, uh, if we ha go more and more to tomosynthesis, where you can actually get 3D uh, pixel, voxel measurements uh, for attenuation and, re and relative density, uh, do you think this problem will go away in terms of the variability between machines? Actually, I think we're going to end up with some of the same issues, that is, depending on vendor and depending on um, version of software, we will potentially see changes. However, as stressed by my colleague in discussions, um, it's, density has become so much more relevant to clinical practice now, such that there may be an effort by the manufacturers and the vendors to come up with a more systematic assessment of density. So a patient can have a TOMO at one place and receive a precise measure of density that's translatable to another location in another yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine that they would have approved the CT scan, I mean, the FDA, if everybody's water measurements didn't scale on the same scale. I mean, we would be really in a lot of trouble with CT, so. I think one of the other questions of tomosynthesis is will it do a better job of associating density with risk? And because uh, it may be uh, that it's more accurate because sure. we are, have a 3D image, a relatively 3D image rather than a 2D image. So I think that's a big question with tomosynthesis that remains to be answered. So, and thinking about your results of the study, and you alluded to this, uh, you know, we're a very mobile society and patients likely will move from, you know, one location to another or another neighborhood and perhaps they'll have their, you know, breast imaging done at different centers uh, using different methods. So uh, in terms of uh, communication with patients, in terms of their, their results or communication with referring doctors, what do you think uh, radiologists should do? to make uh, everyone aware of this issue? Well, I think ideally, and hopefully someday, the vendors won't have as much variability that no matter where you have your mammogram and no matter what system is used, you'll have the same density assessment because it's gonna be very confusing for patients if they get a density letter one year and then not the next year. Sure. Uh, they're not gonna know what to do. So I, I don't think we're there yet, but hopefully someday, and maybe tomosynthesis will be the answer, there will be less variability between vendors. Because I do think that's probably where we're headed, where density will be assessed uh, with these automated methods. So we ran into something similar with bone density measurements when we were using a number of different approaches. And uh, at, uh, I was at Beth Israel Deaconess at the time, and, and people would actually note specifically the machine that it was done on with a little note that this may not be reproducible on some other system. Do you think we should be doing that uh, for these measurements or uh, not necessarily? I think maybe just increasing awareness so that especially if you're following longitudinal changes in the same individual over time, like say assessing response to tamoxifen, just for the individual interpreting the density to know that there's variability in the systems. Well, very good. And, and just to, to follow up on that, you know, something that we can do nowadays is bring images on CD or DVD to another location. So really, if we get to the point where we're assessing longitudinal changes at a point that matters for treatment, um, you know, we can actually have a reassessment of that image on a different software that's being used at that institution. That, that brings up another point, though, is that uh, our Valpar and Quantra that we assess is done with a raw image information. Well, if you bring your CD to another institution, you're not going to have the raw data. So ideally, you'd have a system that performs just as well that can work off the processed uh, image. Well, I think this is uh, very thought-provoking. I can easily see a lot of anxious patients kind of dealing with, but last year I was, you know, this density level, and this year I'm not, nothing happened to me. So anyway, 
I think uh, we'll be sorting this out for a few years to come. I want to thank you both for participating in the podcast. I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure our listeners and viewers will as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.